Hello, everyone. So my project, broadly speaking, is about how we can better use our marine resources to ensure, ensure environmental stability and thus provide economic stability for the people who de are dependent on them for their livelihood. So this is a painting by Al Gromet um, called Fighting Over the Last Piece of Sushi, which I thought was kind of apt for the current uh, stresses we're putting on the ocean as countries are battling over and competing over extracting as many marine source resources as they can, in particular high value uh, products like sushi, or tuna and sushi. Um, this is a graph from the World uh, Food and Agriculture Organization and shows that since about the mid 1980s we've basically plateaued in the amount of um, million tons of uh, seafood we can extract from the oceans and um, to make up the gap for the growing world which is also demanding more and more seafood per person um, aquaculture has really stepped up to fill that need for the, um, such a valuable source of protein and um, yeah so it's been about for the past 30 years it's really been increasing a lot and um, Aquaculture just broadly is just the farming of aquatic organisms and any type of body of water. Um, yeah, so today aquaculture provides almost half actually of all the fish that humans eat worldwide. Um, Chile has been a large part of this picture for many decades and um, in many ways is ahead of countries like the U.S. in terms of production. Um, and the U.S. actually imports 90% of all the seafood that we eat and um, including from countries like Chile. So I will focus my research um, in the area of the Región de los Lagos, um, which is around the island of Chiloé, which is right there. And that has the highest concentration of registered fishermen and also a large proportion of aquaculture leases. And um, the graph, the uh, top species cultivated in Chile um, are the Atlantic salmon by far is the biggest cultivated species but then in terms of mollusks uh, the Chilean oyster uh, not, is one of them as well as the um, Chilean mussel and so I'll be focusing on the Chilean mussel which um, is 95% of all mollusk production. And this is the species Matillus chilensis and um, there are some economic benefits and ecosystem benefits that I'll highlight briefly. Um, as far as water quality improvement, um, all bivalves such as mussels are filter feeders, so they filter phytoplankton, which they eat through their gills, as well as silt. Um, and they, one mussel can filter up to two liters of water per day, so there's hundreds and hundreds of mussels just on one line hanging in the water column. Um, so they're very, very efficient and can prevent nutrient overloading. And then as far as economic benefits, um, they don't need to be fed, unlike salmon. Um, so they're very low cost production and a large overseas market as Chile exports most of their mussels. Um, and then there are some studies that show um, uh, that um, a high concentration of mus mussels can lead to biodisposition overloading and oxygen depletion. So that is some, um, things that people are wary of as far as expanding muscle production. Um, and also, at least in the United States, it's kind of um, a tension as far as the rafts obstruct waterways. Yeah. <laughs> For those of us who don't know, what is biodisposition overloading? Oh. So that would be um, this, the whatever the muscles don't consume and integrate into their body. Um, they, it's basically like their spaces that settle down to the bottom of the of the ocean and gradually build up. Um, yeah, thank you for highlighting that. And but, however, with informed and proactive management, I believe that most of these problems can be largely avoided. And in comparison with the salmon farming industry, the mussel industry has stayed relatively out of the limelight. Um, these are just some article clippings that I took from my own home state of Washington this summer when we had a large Atlantic salmon escape and literally every <laughs> single day there was a headline about farmed salmon and people calling it uh, cook aquaculture and environmental nightmare. 
So, um, it's as it stands, Cook has still uh, has pet net pens in Washington State, but the governor has called for their removal. So we'll see. But anyway, back to my study area in Puerto Montt. Um, this is um, is, it, is uh, one of the largest cities in the South, and as I said, the highest number of registered fishermen. And um, I will be studying, staying there to interview farmers as well as other government officials about what they see as their top priorities in relation to mussel farming. So this next slide is a very broad management structure, which obviously I will refine as I learn more. But basically we have the Serna Pesca and Sub Pesca, which is the service, um, fisheries service, and as well as the Undersecretary of Fisheries and Aquaculture at the national level that um, are informed by an advisory board um, of stakeholders um, uh, across the whole nation. Um, and then regionally, their um, their director, um, their recommendations for how to sustainably manage aquaculture as well as fish stocks are um, performed by the Zonal Directorate of Fisheries and Aquaculture. And then locally, the trade unions and cooperatives are very, very important because um, they implement um, at, at the very at the very small scale how much fish is being extracted from the environment and um, where exactly the leases are going to be. So the general law of fisheries and aquaculture um, created the AMERBs, which stands for the Areas of Management and Exploitation of Bentonic Resources, as well as aquaculture concessions. So that basically gives someone who applies for one of these exclusive rights to exploit that area. So no one else can go into that area. Um, and then uh, challenges the industry is facing today are stability of the seed supply of mussel seeds float or larvae float in the water until they are mature enough to settle on a hard substrate. So until that time, fishermen can collect these seeds from the wild and just with seed collectors. Um, and But there's no way to predict how many mussel seeds will be in the water from season to season. So um, recently, uh, studies have shown that this variability has greatly increased, and some are attributing that to climate change, um, because as ocean salinity increases, um, it increases also muscle mortality. And also, um, um, aquaculture concessions are given to individuals who apply to them, though it has been said that this is a very long and can be difficult process as well as costly. So zoning um, also needs to be, um, is also a issue in how much the ecosystem can, um, can the carrying capacity of the ecosystem, um, how many leases should really be given out in any given area. And then also the stability of this um, collecta, which is cove management over time, is this hyper-localized management really still successful. Um, and also my partner organizations will be INCAR, which is the Interdisciplinary Center for Aquaculture Research, as well as the Universidad de Concepcion. Um, where Fabian Tapia has been as a professor and has been collecting oceanographic data for many years. Um, and then INCAR, its mission is to generate scientific knowledge about um, so that aquaculture continue to con can continue to be productive um, and sustainable. Um, and then overall, I'm, what I hope my goals will be um, is that how can and looking at how we can protect, protect an economy driven mainly by marine resource extraction from the negative effects of climate change. And so are there any opportunities for diversification of these aquaculture systems um, of um, growing different species that are more um, adaptable to climate change and then also are resilient to climate change and then also how relevant still are um, these kinship ties associated with coleta management as mussel farmers often, um, or fishermen in general, from each new generation takes over the, the family business, but in the 21st century, as many people are moving to cities and climate change is affecting their productivity, um, these, this 
uh, cycle might be interrupted and management obviously will have to adapt. And then also as far as what are the local perceptions of climate change and how is it affecting them personally and what are their top priorities for future management. Um, and then also government responses. Uh, so with that, those are the goals I hope to address. Thank you for listening, and I hope you all eat muscles while you're here. <laughs> <laughs>